Hello and welcome to our Sustainability First webinar. I'm Chris McGarry, a partner in White & Case's Capital Markets Practice. Thank you for joining us on such a slow news day, indeed a, a slow news hour. I, I think the latest count results, uh, count updates are due in some key states right about now or while we're online. Um, if Joe Biden is confirmed as the next president, that will be another huge boost for sustainability, not least with Joe Biden's commitment to rejoin the Paris Agreement, which uh, the US exited earlier this week. Before I introduce our all-star panel, a few housekeeping points. Uh, we're hoping to have some time for Q&A at the end of uh, the panel discussion. So please can you submit your questions using the Q&A function on the platform, which hopefully you can all see. We'll also be doing some live polling as we introduce each of the four topics uh, to the panel this evening. Uh, if anyone experiences any technical issues, um, please would you email emeaevents at whitecase.com. That's E-M-E-A events at whitecase.com. And then lastly, as a reminder, we are recording today's webinar and copies of the recording will be available after the event. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our all-star panel. Uh, as I've already told them, I was getting in the mood for today by watching them all on YouTube. Um, so first, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Olivia Albrecht, who's PIMCO's Head of ESG Business Strategy. PIMCO is arguably the most influential sustainable investor globally. It's not just their two trillion, and that's trillion with a T, dollars under management, uh, but for their thought leadership in this space, not least developing the SDG business model. Next, delighted to welcome Sean Kidney. Sean is the chief executive of the Climate Bonds Initiative uh, and also an EU commissioner. In that latter role, uh, Sean was one of the chief architects of um, the EU's new taxonomy regulation. More on that later. Next, we have Anjali Pandit, who is BMP Paribas' primary sustainability manager. Anjali is also a YouTube sensation. Um, and then we have Felipe Fernandez Mendez, who's a treasury director at Tereos. Tereos is a French Brazilian ethanol and agri business uh, with whom we've recently worked on their sustainability linked offering. And last but by no means least, I'm delighted to introduce my partner, Claire Conlon from our litigation practice. Claire is also head of the firm's business and human rights practice. So what is sustainability? The UN defines sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Sustainability has three core objectives. First, arresting climate change. Secondly, protecting life on land and below water. And thirdly, delivering equality as the key to transitioning us to a fairer global economy. The three key factors driving sustainability today are first, capital. Some $30 trillion in rising is already committed to sustainable investments. We need to invest something like $100 trillion over the next decade for the sustainability transition. Now that's a lot of money, but the good news is that private wealth today stands at some $400 trillion. So we have enough money, we just need to put it to use. Secondly, regulation is going to play a key role and already is, with the EU leaving, leading the way. We obviously have great reason to hope that if Joe Biden is the next president, that the US will play catch up in that regard as well. And thirdly, the other key factor in driving sustainability forward today is all of the stakeholders, not just the investors, but all of you consumers out there, governments too. And we know that sustainability is the priority issue for Generation Z or Generation Z for our Amer American audience members, uh, for millennials, Generation X, and even some enlightened boomers like Sean. Um, lastly, by way of introduction, the recent decision by the European Central Bank to start buying sustainable assets with new money from next year paves the way for issuers in all industries to join the party. So if we can have our first polling question, um, and please, we, we invite your participation in that as we move on to the first topic for discussion this evening, the market opportunity for sustainable capital today. If we can start with you, please, Sean. 
Um, sorry, I thought there was a polling question. <laughs> I was all prepared to vote. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, Sean. I, well, I can read out the polling question for you. Um, have no, no, you that's issued... okay. That's okay. I'll dive, I'll, I'll dive in. <laughs> okay, thank you. Look, we have a situation where this is a bit more than just do we want to be nicely comfortable and sustainable in 30 years' time. This is a situation where the house is on fire. The house is on fire and the kids are inside and we've got to get them out. According to the climate scientists we know, we have like 10 years to get emissions down 55% on average globally, not just in Europe, on average globally, or else we literally do not have a reasonable chance of any kind of sustainable, let's call it livable, future for our kids. That's what's at stake here. And every minute that we allow the situation to continue to get worse, which is what's been happening for the last 30 years, is another minute that we have to claw back in that 10 year time frame. So I, I wanna say, you know, sustainability can be a lot of things, right? When I'm comfortable lying in the sun and having a bit of lunch, sustainability is more of those lunches and more sunny days. When my house is on fire and the kids are inside, sustainability is getting the kids out and stopping that fire. We need to understand that right now where the house is on fire. That's exactly what we've got in front of us. That requires rapidity of action and it requires hard decisions about what to do and what to not bother doing now until we get the rest sorted out. That's my first point. The good point is that in that particular mix, we know what to do. We have the solution set in front of us, the clean energy, the electric transports and so on. And as you say, hey, we've got the capital. I mean, how lucky are we? We've got the capital, that 400 trillion you mentioned. So really, the job's really simple, right? It's for bankers, it's for lawyers, it's for treasurers of agri companies in, in Brazil to just make the money flow to the right places. That's the job. And that makes it so achievable that actually I get up every morning of hope because I think this can work. And we've got proof. You issue green bonds, you issue sustainability linked bonds like Toreos, and investors flock to them. It is an amazing growth market. We've already got a trillion and a half of sustainable link land, green, blue, resilience and transition bonds out there. We've got rule sets proliferating. We've got central banks creating incentives all around the world. We've got governments creating incentives. Like in Europe, with investment funds, the recovery and resilience fund, 750 billion euros. A third green is going to be, and the other two third must address resilience. This is happening in, in China and other places as well. So there is a sea change underway. And the sea change underway is exemplified by the fact that Biden has won. We've had EU targets set in the last two months, which are extraordinary. 20, 2050 targets and 2030 targets. Japan, Korea, China, and now US. The bulk of the world's economy are going in hard and tough on what we need to do. The investors want this. They will invest in scale. The central banks want this. Guys, why isn't Torrios bringing out a few more billion bonds in a hurry? Because the demand is extraordinary. That's the opportunity. That's the opportunity. Making money, safe, secure, supported by governments, and save our civilization at the same time. What's not to like? Thank you, Sean. And that's a, a neat segue to move on to the investor perspective now. And uh, Olivia, Sean's already alluded to the fact that, you know, green bonds, sustainability linked, anything that touches sustainability flies off the shelf. So we're very interested to hear both your perspective as, you know, the narrow economic um, factors that drive your investment policy. And then also, if you can maybe give us an insight into the, you know, the evolution of the market where we're going to see investors potentially paying up for sustainability. Yes. Well, I'm happy to hear the uh, official news report that Biden has won uh, the presidency <laughs> uh, in the U.S. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, it's been a uh, unusual 48 hours, and I'll look forward to the next 24 hours. But what I want to do maybe is to frame the conversation in terms of how um, asset managers are addressing sustainability in their investment uh, management and uh, the ability to fulfill our fiduciary duty 
Then I want to dig into some of the key trends that we've seen from global investors that have been really um, driving uh, the innovation in sustainable uh, investing. And then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about market dynamics in fixed income, because I think this is going to be an interesting um, topic as well. And then lastly, I want to round out by making some observations about uh, the next four years, uh, no matter what the outcome is uh, over the next couple of days. So as an asset manager, I think we have really bifurcated two worlds, and both of which are very important. One is we have to, as stewards of capital, ensure that we are looking at every risk and opportunity associated with our investments, whether those get classified as environmental, social, or governance, or more financial uh, in nature. Um, so we have to consider how regulatory and policy changes will impact certain industries and issuers. We have to evaluate how social practices with employees will impact a company's ability to attract and retain the next generation of talent as they um, hunt for talent uh, in the years ahead. We have to reflect that in our investment process for the nearly or for the north of $2 trillion of assets that we manage. And increasingly, we have to think about how sustainability themes will impact our macro forecasting. And we've invested uh, a ton in terms of scenario analysis at the macro level, thinking about how climate risk uh, will play out in a variety of scenarios and have to be incorporated into our macro forecasting models. This is the level of diligence that's required of asset managers today. So that's one pillar of work that we have to focus on. The second pillar of work is really around the sustainable solutions, which is just ever increasing from investors around the world whether those are carbon metrics, climate metrics, a desire for more green, social, sustainability-linked bonds in their portfolios, this portion of the market is exploding. And that is why you have seen such incredible demand when new issuance comes out from issuers around the world who are bringing green, social, sustainability-linked bonds to the market that they're oversubscribed. You have investors who are different uh, investor base for issuers when they come to market. They're stickier, they're long-term investors, um, and there's just not enough supply of these types of bonds in the market today. That's why we're so excited about the sustainability-linked bonds, where we think we can get a larger group of issuers and a broader set of investments brought to the market. Lastly, just to, to make an um, observation, no matter who wins the presidency uh, in the United States, the United States uh, continues to make incredible strides despite uh, lack of support from Washington, D.C. And I just want to recognize the important work that multinational companies headquartered in the U.S. have made in terms of net zero carbon commitments, states, locals, municipalities who have also kind of stepped up where the baton was dropped uh, at the federal level. So regardless of the outcome, I think we're in good shape to continue to see the U.S. in terms of private sector and state local governments uh, supporting the initiatives of net zero carbon uh, for many of those um, asset owners. And that's that's an excellent point, Olivia. And the 400 trillion of private wealth, you know, that that doesn't have any borders. And so we've seen, you know, as you just described, people voting with their feet effectively. And, you know, about half of that private wealth is in the US. And, you know, people are already taking this as seriously as they need to. Um, so if we can go to Anjali next for the bank perspective, um, and we'd love to hear about, you know, BMP's integration of the UN SDGs into your business model. And if you have time just to tell us about the millennial perspective as well, and Julie, I, I know a lot of people joining us today would, would, would be interested to hear that. Sure. Um, okay. I think I count still as a millennial, just about. Um, so I think, first of all, the fascinating thing about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is that obviously they were not put together and passed to be an investment metrics. That's not they're what they were meant for but that's what they've turned into you know and we work really closely olivia with so many of your colleagues at pimco we work closely with all the major large asset managers and also the niche ones and i am blown away by the number of um, investors who are integrating the united nations sustainable development girls across their portfolio which is a total nightmare of data and disclosure and analysis <laughs> <laughs> I can see Olivia smiling. Um, and even harder, to be honest, is for companies. You know, and Therese, you guys know this really well. You're close to it on the ground, you know, trying to understand what the sustainable development goals mean in every jurisdiction in which you work, in the very local regional context that is so unique and, and so different, and trying to explain that to investors all over the world. You know, it's a, it's a very 
uh, it's a very tricky area. And I think that's where banks play such a crucial role because we act as sort of a link um, between uh, issuers and companies all around the world who are trying to access the capital they require to solve problems within their own business model, to take advantage of opportunities in terms of finding solutions to sustainable development goals. And then obviously, um, you know, in investors, um, on the other hand, who have that capital and are increasingly, as Olivia mentioned very well, trying to move it in the direction of, and it's not just in terms of the direction of trying to solve the sustainable development goals, but actually the direction that's going to be relevant to the future of what our economy is going to need. And so it's also very much, you know, from a risk perspective. And um, as a bank, I think we see ourselves a little bit at first stop. Um, it's our responsibility to study the businesses that we work with. Um, you know, Sean, as you mentioned, to decide what kind of business we will and also kind of business we will not do. Um, and to encourage um, companies that we work with to make more ambitious sustainability targets and to take them along the way. So we use the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, to study our loan book. Um, we use it in our engagement with all of our clients, investors and corporates. Um, and increasingly, we're finding it at the heart of the type of business we do as we integrate um, you know, different types of sustainable finance um, products into every single business line across the bank. Oh, and sorry, millennials, right? What's the right? Trying to see how to connect. I mean, I think at the, at fundamentally at the end of all of this is it's being driven by a consumer preference. And whether that's consumers thinking about it from my pension, whether that's consumers on the street in Extinction Rebellion, you know, yelling that our house is on fire, right, Sean? Um, whether that's wanting to recruit the next bit of talent into the finance industry, into companies, um, into asset managers, into you know law firms, you know increasingly that you know that is becoming such an important subject to everyone. And I think with COVID, everyone's sitting at home in their houses, thinking about mental health, thinking about physical health, thinking about poverty and unemployment, watching the divisiveness of politics globally. You know, it's it's. It's so now intrinsic in who we are and as our home and work combine, I think, you know, it started off as a maybe the millennials pushing the conversation, but quite frankly, I'm going to say in the last few months, I am just overwhelmed with, you know, Sean's generation <laughs> and how much they are, you know, pushing the handle back to us and, and, and taking it forward. So I think it's really a global conversation of old people, all color, all age now. <laughs> Thank goodness, and Julie, for that. And um, lastly, on on our first topic, um, Felipe, I know many people in the audience today are, are going to be really in, interested to hear the issuer's perspective. And you know, Tereus is in some business sectors that maybe traditionally it might not have been obvious about accessing, you know, pure play green bonds. But if you can tell us about your your experience, your journey with green finance, and then into sustainability linked. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris and Martin Case for the, the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here discussing such a, an important topic. Maybe before we, we talk a bit about our recent experience with green finance, a word of introduction about Tereos. Tereos is a agribusiness multinational producing sugar, ethanol, starch and energy within four continents. We, we are present in America, Europe, Africa and Asia. We we have our history starts seven years ago in France, but we have built an important position here in Brazil. In the past twenty years, we we became the one of the five largest players in in this industry. And turning to sustainable finance, I would say that Brazil is at the beginning of its journey uh, compared to Europe and US. But we rapidly we are rapidly increasing. Uh, with the support of CBI, our Brazilian Central Bank, and also uh, the, the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, this year, we were able already to raise 16 billion uh, reais compared to 9 billion reais last year. It's still uh, a, a small market in Brazil. It's just 1%, but it's growing very fast. And with Tereos, it's, it's not different. Uh, our experience with green finance is also new. Uh, although we have been following sustainability for quite a while, I would say that for 10 years now we have a dedicated uh, sustainability director and team following the subject. I believe that the sec this sector in general has become much more sustainable in the past 10, 15 years. 
looking at several perspectives, we stopped it. First, we stopped burning sugar cane for more than five years now. We learned a lot across the years to extract the most of our raw materials. And then we have good examples such as exploring the most of our bad gas, producing energy. And also now we have a new phase of investments to biogas production. So linking sustainability to our low ones was the, the, the last mile to cover, I would say. We, we have a strong exposure to global banks and we have been noticed in the past uh, two years, mostly a strong in, uh, increase in, in interest. Uh, then we raised in June this year, uh, 105 million US dollar sustainability link in Lowen with the support of seven banks, BNP included. Uh, and we were very glad to be the first company in this industry to, to issue a, a, a green loan in Brazil. So uh, this was quite happy for us. And talking about the law in itself, it's uh, the, the framework, we have four KPIs. We are committing with reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We are committing with reducing the water usage, which is quite intense in, in, in our operations. Uh, growing the, the rate of uh, certified sugar cane, ourselves and our suppliers, and a rate improvement on an ESG perspective with Ecovadis. In that sense, I'm happy to, to tell as well that our parent company has also continued this trend with a, a five-year sustainability uh, RCF of 200 million euros last month. And just to, to, to close my comments, since this first year, we, we decided to always challenge ourselves when it comes to structured operations. Why not go for a green financing? And I'm happy to tell you that uh, right now we are working on two tra green transactions. The first one is a capital market transaction. And the second one is a 12-year financing with a development bank. So. This trend is, is something we, we really want to, to keep for, for the future. Thank you, Felipe. And if we could please see the results of the first polling question. OK, so we're, we're already preaching to, to uh, the choir to a reasonable degree. Hopefully, the other 27% uh, will have persuaded you uh, to change your answer to yes uh, by the end of the session. If, um, if, if the audience could please take a, look, take a look at polling question number two now while, while we move on to topic number two. So very clearly, climate change is the most time critical and, and the number one priority of sustainability. But something we've seen, and, and Anjali and Olivia uh, mentioned it in their opening remarks, that the global pandemic has accelerated some of the wider uh, sustainability issues as well. We've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, gender equality is also critically important uh, to that. So um, what are the sustainability priorities after climate change? And Claire, if we could start with your perspective, please. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon. Sustainability can mean a lot of different things uh, to different people, and I think we've heard a number of those already, but just thinking about the Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 goals and climate action is, is one of those. And there's a lot of interconnected um, actions that can be taken when you, when you look at all 17 um, of, of those goals. Um, they range from eliminating poverty to good health, well-being, education and reducing inequalities, peace and justice and strengthening institutions. Um, and many of those SDGs relate to um, protecting human rights. And I think you can't talk about the SDGs in total isolation. You need to think about them alongside the UN guiding principles uh, on business and human rights. It's not an either or SDGs or UN guiding principles they're, they're part of the same um, interwoven fabric. And the, the, so the UN guiding principles are a set of guidelines for states and companies to prevent and address human rights abuses committed in, in business operations. They grew out of um, a three pillar framework um, called protect, respect and remedy. Uh, the three pillars being protect, the unequivocal duty of states 
to protect human rights, respect the responsibility of businesses to respect human rights, and remedy the fundamental right of individuals and communities to access effective remedy when their rights have been adversely affected by business activities. And underlying all of this is the recognition that businesses can impact human rights in their operations, not only their own employees, but also consumers and communities where they operate. And that impact on human rights can be positive um, and it could be access to education, one of the SDGs, but it can of course also be negative from pollution, forced labor, evictions. So climate change and climate action is critical, but the UN guiding principles affirm also the responsibility of business to prevent, mitigate, and where appropriate, remedy human rights abuses that they cause or contribute to. And that's critical for sustainability. So I mean, the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights issued the statement that human rights create conditions essential for sustainable development. And since the um, UN Guiding Principles were published, the business and human rights landscape has seen dramatic transformation. And companies are now facing the task of navigating these risks in different jurisdictions um, and opportunities in an environment where jurisdictions are steadily turning the, the soft law or principles and other voluntary initiatives into hard law, uh, mandatory requirements. And the, the drivers for that change are coming from different directions. Um, investors, certainly investor pressure is, is having a big impact on corporate uh, behavior change. Um, for, but for businesses to realize their contribution to sustainable development, it necessarily will require effort to include respect for human rights as part of that strategy. Thank you, Claire. If we if we can move to Olivia next for the investor perspective on you know the other SDGs you're tackling and you know one of the options in the polling question the audience are looking at now is on pandemic mitigation and I think it's on the doodle that somewhere that hopefully people can see on screen but we saw the EU's recent 17 billion pandemic relief but um, you know and we know um, uh, uh, Olivia how engaged Pimco is with gender equality and the willingness to you know, look at that where it's hardest for, you know, in the sovereign space in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So what are, you, what are your priorities uh, as an investor? Well, I don't know if I can uh, neatly say what the specific priorities are because they are broad and they're deeply interconnected, as we can see with the sustainable development goals. They're not, you know, mutually exclusive set of um, initiatives to partake in. There's a deep interdependency, which I think is a good thing, um, because as we look to mitigate, for example, climate risk as uh, climate as one of the uh, you know SDG icons, right? Alongside, you're likely also addressing, um, you know, clean water, access to, uh, you know, reduction of inequality in some instances. I mean, they're all kind of deeply interconnected, uh, particularly with biodiversity and, and climate risk in particular. I guess maybe one observation that I would make is to contextualize the efforts around sustainable finance over the past several years and then where we are today in 2020. Because I think for probably many of us uh, on the line today, I think there was a concern in, in March and April as we hit the kind of hopefully the apex of the uh, global pandemic, that all of a sudden we would have a pullback in the commitments for climate change and climate risk, whether there were net zero commitments or asset owners making commitments for their long term uh, portfolio allocations to be better aligned to uh, net zero uh, or Paris alignment. Uh, we felt like there could be a pullback um, with the needs that were going to clearly come due with COVID-19. Um, and what we actually saw was that there was, uh, as you rightly said, Chris, uh, actually an acceleration of focus on sustainability. But it was a broadening out of what those sustainability factors were to evaluate and consider. Uh, we saw a, a reduction uh, for a period of time in green bond issuance. But to take its uh, position uh, and broaden it out in terms of issuance, we saw more social bonds being used. Again, green bonds being used to finance use of proceeds projects focused on renewable energy, S social bonds being use of proceeds bonds that were focused on specific social initiatives, programs, et cetera. And we did see 
you know, corporations, sovereign issuers, municipalities, even nonprofit organizations with the Ford Foundation coming out with a social bond that sought to address um, uh, uh, and reduce uh, inequalities across the globe uh, and uh, focus on COVID-19 kind of response and recovery. So we saw this kind of social bond movement kind of pick up and clearly there will be a focus uh, post 2020 on social factors. You think about the evolution that we've seen in the green bond space and climate risk, um, and we've seen tremendous progress in terms of uh, issuer disclosure, consistency of methodology, uh, data, all sorts of different features that have uh, tremendously improved over the past five to 10 years to allow us to think about amazing goals like how do you build portfolios that are net carbon zero uh, across all of the asset classes that asset owners take exposure to and their trillions of dollars of assets uh, we can do that because we have good data and that's because we invested hard over the past five and ten years and more to figure out the right lexicon and the right um, you know methodologies and frameworks for evaluating these data sets we are just in the early innings for the same uh, focus that we need for social factors we don't even have gender diversity uh, information for most of the uh, public companies, let alone, companies, let alone uh, parts of the market that aren't corporate uh, in orientation. Today, less than uh, less than 15% of the S&P 500 companies disclose information around gender diversity across their management ranks. Uh, less than 10% are showing that data across racial diversity within their management ranks. And less than 5% are even giving you information around um, employees that may be uh, disabled or other kind of minority re represented groups. So we're just at the cusp of starting to focus on what those social factors are. And I suspect one of the, um, one of the byproducts of post 2020 will be a deep focus from investors, asset owners, all parts of the capital markets to focus more social factors going forward. Thank you, Olivia. So, you know, we're already starting to see that investors, sorry, issuers rather, are tackling multiple SDGs with our offering. And it's very clear that the direction of, you know, what the direction of travel is, we're going to see an increase with that. And as Julie mentioned, the SDGs, SDG 5, for example, on gender equality, you know, we have the metrics now that issuers can use. So you said it, Olivia, around board composition, any issue who wants to put a hard commitment around closing the gender pay gap in their organization, you know, we know the demand's going to be there. Felipe, if you could talk to us um, about your experience and, you know, approach to sustainable agriculture and this idea of, you know, that touching multiple SDGs. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I, I think that th my first comment is there is a strong drive, of course, in, in this industry for greenhouse gases emissions reduction uh, in our sustainable law when we we just cover scope one and two but it encouraged us to also uh, assess our scope three emissions and, and understand and address but we we do have a, a road map in terms of ESG guidelines following United Nations uh, and today we have four pillars the first one is positive industry and this is really more related to uh, committing to reduce energy consumption uh, uh, water usage which is very intense in the operations greenhouse gases emissions and also increasing the the use of waste uh, the second one is nutrition this is more related to our parent company because they have a strong position in the weight with protein business they become the, the second largest uh, uh, player in the world in the in terms of wheat protein. The third pillar is people and communities. And here, uh, uh, since reducing accidents in the operations, and we have done a good job uh, uh, in that sense in the past, and also uh, uh, to promote gender equality. Looking outside the, outside the company, we did a, a strong job uh, uh, with, with the surrounding communities this year. With the COVID crisis, we shifted production from uh, ethanol to sanitizer to support a lot of hospitals. And, and the last one is sustainable agriculture. So we are committing, of course, with the uh, uh, increasing the rate of uh, certified raw material. 
ourselves and our suppliers today we we have uh, a bit more than one third of our raw materials certified and we want to increase that throughout the years and just to to get a link on what uh, uh olivia was saying i think that this industry has done a, a great job in terms of environmental gains but i think we have a lot of room to 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 work and to be done in terms of people diversity and gender equality it's a very male industry so i do believe that uh, uh, first we'll have this industry consolidated in the green finance and it would be quite welcome to 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 have a further transition to social bonds and low and uh, i do believe in that Thank you, Felipe. So we're seeing the results of polling question number two. It was a bit of a tricky question, a bit of a trick question in a way, but it's quite interesting to see that, you know, that these are big issues, all of them are huge issues. Um, but, you know, all of the above well, was, the, was the most popular answer, which is sort of what we hoped you would, <laughs> you would answer. So if the audience could please take a look at polling question number three, and that's when we put you guys on the spot. I'm riffing from Anjuli's playbook. Uh, with it with this question so it's encouraging us all as individuals to take action hopefully you're getting the vibe that every issue and investor you know in your in your job you can start taking some action so our third topic is on the energy transition you know uh, which is probably the most uh, important sort of issue facing us this decade um so sean if you if we could come to you first please if you could um you know view this uh, topic through the eu taxonomy uh, and then also maybe tell us about the other critical, you know, geopolitical blocks in the world, US, China, India, where they're at. Yikes, that's a big agenda. I'm gonna have to do a TEDx speech like Andrew's done. And by the way, if you haven't checked out her YouTube videos, have a look, she's a superstar. <laughs> um, look, that's a big topic. I first have to make a comment on SDGs. Stop thinking fragmentation. Stop thinking separate different silos. These are all the same thing. One thing we have to learn from the COVID crisis, which is a climate crisis. It's around pathogens jumping between species as a result of environmental degradation. The IPCC has been predicting a century of pandemics for the last 30 years. Guys, it's just the first one that got away and it won't be the last one. That's the nature of climate change. Climate change in the 1600s, the medieval times, after the Roman Empire led to pandemics, one after another. So the stuff we learn about resilience and recovery in the pandemic is a climate investment. We need to understand there's going to be other crises, floods in Bangladesh, collapsed societies in sub-Saharan Africa. These as a result of climate change. We've already seen them so far. So inoculating against catastrophic climate change is our emissions job over the next 10 years. If we get emissions down 55%, we have a shot, only a shot, to get those kids out of a burning house, but it is a shot. At the same time, we have to prepare for the other shocks. Now, the SDGs are essentially a list of indicators of resilience. Each one of them can be taken as indicators. Even on the human rights issue, I mean, there's overlap. Now, they don't, they're relevant in their own right, don't get me wrong, but look at human rights in Bangladesh. A third of people who die in floods are women. Why? Because they're at home while the men are in the cities working in textile factories and they don't know how to read, so they don't read notices that come around and they don't have access to radios. That's a human rights issue as a result of climate change. And we're going to get a lot more of that. So it's integrated. So we've got to understand this, right? Stop thinking silos. We are going to end up in a huge universe where all of this is part of the same issue of how we manage our planet sustainably. Because that's what it's about. This is what this crisis, which is an existential extinction potential crisis for the human species is about. Do we start managing things sustainably and survive, or do we keep managing things unsustainably and frankly, probably disappear as a species? Okay, rant over. Energy. We've made some progress in energy. You know, frankly, you are mad anywhere in the world considering fossil fuels when you can consider renewables and solar and others because the cost is down. We're learning this. Municipalities in the US of all places 
are buying solar instead of gas because it's cheaper. They don't care about the green green side of it. So that has actually happened. There are some hard fights to understand. What Chris is referring to is the European taxonomy. We have said 100 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour is the threshold. What we have said is taken the 2018 IPCC report and the 2018 World Energy Outlook, one point green modeling, and we've said, what's in there? Well, I'll tell you what's in there. To meet the Paris Agreement, there can be no unabated fossil fuel investments that are new. Zip, nada, none. Jesus, that is confronting. That is confronting for every government in the world that has chosen gas as a transition. The window for gas as transition guys closed a few years ago. And we have, we're, we're just catching up with it. That is what the taxonomy says. That is now what we have to get used to around the world. It is tough. It is challenging. The, year, the Chinese taxonomy governing the green bond market in China has come out excluding fossil fuel generation. The ASEAN Capital Markets Association, that's the regulators, green bond guidelines excludes fossil fuel generation. I had a little argument with my friend of HSBC on a forum this morning in Hong Kong. He said, but surely gas is necessary for Hong Kong. Europe can't, it's one atmosphere. Now, there will be regional differences around sequestration land use and so on. But when it comes down to energy, we kind of need to understand the house is on fire, turn off the gas guys, turn off the coal. It's not a hard thing to understand. The European taxonomy is making it super clear. The Biden administration, I'm pretty confident, Olivia, the Biden administration is now going to have to wrestle with this because this is challenging for the US economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's where energy is. The rest is easy. You know, we're, we're building grids, we're building uh, batteries, we're building our electric vehicles, we are electrifying our economies at such an incredible speed, it's going to be like Broadway in 1910. There's a famous photo at Times Square in 1900. One car in the background, it's all horses. The same photo in 1910. And Angela, I'm not that old, I promise you, really. In 1910, all cars, one horse in the background. In 10 years, between 1900 and 1910, the world changed. We are in the middle of that now when it comes to energy and vehicles. And there are consequences for things like oil companies that we're only just beginning to understand. It's not simply that the market cap of BP and Exxon were exceeded by the market cap of Nextera and Orsted a few weeks ago. It is that all of their reserves are useless unless they change super fast. So that's kind of the energy story, Chris. Simple, really, isn't it? Thank you, Sean. We're slightly short on time. So um, I think I'm going to uh, go to Anjuli next on the energy transition. And I think we'd be really interested to hear about, you know, the, your approach as a lender, um, you know, and also, also as an issuer. I think, listen, we are in a, in a complex position because we have people like Sean who touch a lot of things that we feel in our heart and we agree with from a rational perspective. Um, but we also have lots of clients that aren't necessarily able to make such a drastic change in the, the time span that, you know, people are asking them to do. And, and then we have obviously investor clients like PIMCO who, um, who we really respect because we know they're doing such a detailed thorough analysis and they're coming from a place that's full of the data and what they're asking from issuers. And so we are in this position where we have to find a way to combine the judgments of investors, of experts, of science, of regulators um, to help all of our clients make a decision on what they're going to do and to accompany, accompany them on that journey. And that means that sometimes we have to let them know that their access to capital is extremely um, in danger, both from us as a lender, um, as well as from the market. Um, and we have to explain that reality. Um, I'm, I used to spend most of my time only working on sustainable bonds and helping companies like Terios who are ready to go to the market 
um, to make sure that they had the right product, the right framework, um, that they fit now with the EU taxonomy, um, you know, and that they were genuinely bringing a green asset to investors. Um, but now I'm actually spending a lot of my time uh, with issuers that want to do conventional issuance and are concerned about how they're going to be viewed from a negative screening perspective. And that is very much an extremely real reality. You know, um, Sean mentioned a few sectors and from a banking perspective, I can say that there's some of those sectors that if they can't tell a good enough solid story on how they see actually the end of their own business model and the beginning of a new business model, um, you know, we, we are very clear to them that there's a larger every day, an increasingly large group of investors who are going to struggle providing you capital in the medium or long term. Um, and, and that's going to ultimately put a pressure on, on a lot of companies to make those changes if the regulation isn't fast enough. Because as we all know, um, you know, to really do sustainable finance, you need to be going way above and beyond the regulation. Do you guys agree with that? I think you really have to sort of show that you are trying to push the industry, trying to push your own business, trying to push your entire supply chain and ecosystem around you. Um, to find the solutions in the next dimension, and and uh, and as a bank, you know we have we have decided that we are going to be the bank for the energy transition, which means that we have to train everyone in the bank, anyone who's client facing, anyone who supports, anyone who's client facing. So therefore, that means everyone needs to be conversant in this language, um, needs to know what it means for their client, and needs to be able to advise that client either by saying you know what the reality is for your industry that is going to suffer or um, by encouraging the client to, to make that change and provide them vehicles for new types of finance for all the positive things that they're doing. Thank you, and Julie. And you know, something that um, a few years ago, another bank, ING, they, they wrote to all of their commercial real estate borrowers and said, we're not gonna renew your loan uh, unless, unless you um, make the property energy efficient. And at that time, people thought that was you know, some sort of commercial suicide. But as you know, Sean has so vividly explained, we're at a point where you know it, we are having to make sort of binary decisions. Um, but with the sustainability link model, you know now everyone can you know get your board and um, you know use the capital that's out there to go on the transition, which will reduce the issue of you know stranded assets, etc. So if we um, you know it's great to see the results of polling question three there. Um, you know, the vast majority of our audience are doing something on a personal level to make a difference, which is great. If we can have our last, pro, um, our fourth polling question now, which we're hoping is really going to illustrate something that we've, you know, been talking about so far this evening, that it's very apparent to all of us um, that the, you know, greed is good model is over it. You know, arguably it served its purpose at one time, but we're way beyond that now. Uh, so, you know, the fourth polling question there, we'll be interested to see your results. Um, so our fourth topic is on risk management. We've been talking a lot about the financing piece, um, but there's also, you know, sadly, risk management has several dimensions now. Um, you know, Claire, if, 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 we can, if we can start with you and, uh, you know, Halloween's just passed, um, but, you know, for any issuers out there, corporates out there who are engaged in non-sustainable practices, you know, what are the messages um, that you have from them, you know, from courts around the world and, um, you know, how they should be approaching some of these issues? About risks, you, all should, you should also talk about opportunities, but I've got limited time. So I'm just going to focus on three broad categories of risks. Um, and I, th there, are, there are many. Um, so in my, my three categories are transparency and due diligence litigation risk um, and reputation risk. So on transparency, I think we've we heard from Olivia, a lot of investors are now looking at um, a, a wide range of metrics when they're looking at it, investing um, in, in companies. And some of those are voluntary um, you, and some of them are, are mandatory um, and, then, and more are on the way. So the, at the EU level, the European Commissioner for Justice, um, Didier Reinders, announced in April this year that there would be proposed legislation for mandatory corporate sustainability due diligence 
Um, and the report um, for that proposed legislation has now been published in September that makes specific recommendations for a directive to implement mandatory human rights, environment and good governance due diligence legislation. And the, the aims being stated to, to ensure harmonization, legal certainty and the securing of a level playing field. And there are proposed to be civil penalties for failure to comply and possibly criminal penalties as well. Um, in the UK, the government has announced uh, measures that will bolster the reporting requirements under the Modern Slavery Act, under which large businesses must issue annual statements on the steps that they're taking to ensure modern slavery doesn't exist in their supply chains. Uh, the question of penalties uh, hasn't yet been addressed, but it will come back um, where, when we look at the civil uh, single enforcement body at some point next year. Um, the, the, uh, the many other countries are now introducing uh, other transparency measures, the Australian Modern Slavery Act, there's the Netherlands mandatory child labor due diligence. In France, the duty of vigilance legislation requires large companies to establish annual due diligence plans with civil penalties, again, for failure to implement. And some of the first cases have now been brought under that legislation. Um, and, and as I say, more is on the way. The UK government has also recently announced a proposal for supply chain due diligence for commodities at forest risk related to illegal deforestation. So some of these laws are already in force, others are being strengthened and others still in consultation phase, but the direction of travel is clear. There's increased scrutiny uh, for corporate impact on the environment and human rights. So second big category of risk, litigation. Um, cases are now being brought, brought against companies for the adverse impact that they've had on human rights and the environment. A landmark case in the UK last year, the UK Supreme Court confirmed that a UK domiciled parent company can owe a direct duty of care to third parties for the actions of their foreign subsidiaries. Uh, the, the Vedanta case, the, 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 the Supreme Court has confirmed that that duty of care can exist. The mining and tech sectors have been a particular focus um, for, for some of this legislation. There have been cases in the US, um, UK, Canada, uh, and, and, uh, and France and, and elsewhere. And an increase in climate related actions are now being brought as well that's putting pressure on legislators and regulators. Claims being brought against energy companies and governments. Um, causation will remain a key hurdle for these sorts of claims, um, but they're, they're, they're ranging from direct impact for damages um, to failure to disclose. So linked to the transparency first category, claims are being brought by shareholders um, and others withstanding that, that for companies that have failed to disclose climate risk. Um, and, and that will continue, even allegations of fraud if companies have failed to disclose those risks. Um, arbitration is now uh, recognized as a potential forum for issues related to climate change and the environment. The ICC has a task force for the arbitration of climate change related disputes. Uh, and, and there will be other fora that will exist. So third big category, I'm running out of time, uh, re reputation and market opportunity. So linked to the, even when there aren't claims being brought, corporate behavior is being influenced by impact on reputation and market opportunity through other pressures. Various stakeholder groups, um, groups of investors acting uh, together, consumer action, boycotts. Um, in M&A and refinancing transactions, we're seeing that due diligence is revealing risk that's impacting price. Um, and industry voluntary schemes, um, again, mining sector, tech sector have examples that if you are not um, participating in some of these schemes, it can close off market opportunity. Thank you, Claire. And Sean, if we could come to you briefly now to tell us about, you know, unfortunately, the countries were actually arresting climate change, it's too late. So we're already on to, you know, mitigation defense. Well, sorry, Chris, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at there. I mean, yes, it is too late in many cases the world we will see a, a drastically different world for our children that's the truth of it miami will disappear um as a livable city and etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's the place they can afford to survive right that doesn't you don't get the same situation if you're looking at dakar or you're looking in in um, lagos or places like that so uh, there's going to be a lot of very tough stuff happening uh, my hope is that even if we f fail on our climate objectives, our emissions reductions, and you know, by failing, I mean failing catastrophic climate change, and I think we've, got a good, we've still got a good shot at that, then we will at least learn to work, how to, learn to work together better. 
You know, I think our hope has to be that the thing we learn by tackling climate change as a species, as a planet, how to solve problems together for each other, is that when crisis comes, we learn to help each other and support each other. If we don't do that, all is lost. Mm, frankly, we don't deserve to be a species in this planet if we don't learn to do that anyway. And so that's what I look at. But I want to say, not all is lost. We've got 10 years, guys, to get emissions down. Now, we've got to address a whole lot of other stuff, but emissions, if we don't get emissions down at least 55%, everything else is lost. Everything else you have imagined about E, S, and G is gone because our economies go, our politics go, we get Trumps on steroids. Sorry, I didn't mean any disrespect to my American friends. It becomes a crazy politics, a crazy world on a decline, a bit like the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages after Roman times with perhaps even more severe consequences uh, in the sense that we don't know whether humans can live at 1,000 ppm, which is what's currently projected by 2100. We actually don't know the species can survive. We do know we become a lot stupider. Our brain functions become slower. So as we get more emissions, our brain functions become slower. Logical. So that's what we got. We've got the money, guys. We've got the money. We've shown this last year we can mobilize the money. We know what to do. There's no rocket science. Forget R&D. It's rubbish. We can shift our economies, and there are many examples around the world now, like South Australia, which has gone entirely clean from being a very dirty economy 15 years ago. We can do this around the world, and we can do it around our sustainability matters as well. We can create fairness for all. It's not actually hard. We've done it in many different sorts of countries, but I'm just going to say there's a clock ticking for all of you out there. Run, don't walk. Thank you, Sean. So uh, with an eye on the uh, on the clock, if we could just come come to you, Olivia, last for the final sort of investor perspective with uh, maybe a note of, of optimism for, <laughs> for, for uh, from you after that. Yeah, we'll be delighted to, to do that. Um, look, at, just listening to the past couple of uh, comments from, from uh, colleagues on the line with Claire and Sean and Anjali, um, I think one comment that I'd like to make is when folks think about what are the biggest risks that investors are missing today, I think the biggest risk is the uh, pace of change. The factors that Sean is talking about, he's absolutely right. Uh, people are not walking to the exits, they are running to the exits. And what I think investors broadly are missing is the pace of change can move so quickly. You get a 1900 scenario with uh, carts and buggy, horses and buggies, and then in 1910, you have all cars in the same jurisdictions, right? The same process is going to happen, but it's accelerated because we're so much faster with the technological advancements. So don't be lulled into thinking that sustainability factors are an out year 10, 20, 30 year problem. It is a today problem. And those pay, that pace of change is being pulled forward so quickly that you can't just be lulled into complacency as you wait for the future to, to unfold. Um, and you see that playing out in markets today. Name a coal company today that's investment grade. It's hard because there are none. They're all high yield because there's no banking uh, and access to capital for these companies because the investor preferences have so fundamentally shifted and the policies and regulations around uh, these industries have shifted uh, to make coal um, you know, prohibitive to effectively finance today. Well, we're starting to see that play through in the utility space as well. Utility companies that are run off of cold are getting punished in the markets. This is the first time we've seen it play out with utility companies across the U.S. who have a coal dominant uh, energy mix are getting priced differently than their counterparts who have moved on to transition fuels of nat gas or have even moved uh, toward clean energy and renewable energy sources. That is a big deal. And what Sean said in passing. Uh, is really important. So let me re-emphasize it. Nextera, a renewable energy-based uh, utility, has now exceeded the market cap of some of the largest and most prominent oil and gas companies in the world. This is big. We are seeing these numbers play into markets and fundamentals today. And as we like to say, look, I don't know when exactly it's going to hit the oil and gas uh, majors, but uh, we know we don't want to be the last 25% of investors still holding those securities. So we got to make the transition today. We got to recognize that the pace of change is moving much more rapidly than any of us probably had anticipated. And that is a good thing because as Sean said, we all need to start uh, running to solve these problems, not just walking casually. 
Thank you, Olivia. And we're nearly out of time, but one excellent question that's come through, I don't know if anyone will be willing to take it, is uh, have any of the panelists had contact with the Biden transition team yet at this point? Don't know if anyone's going to uh, be willing to take that one. Oh, I see a hand there. I see a hand there, Sean. Probably that's about as much as you can say, but that's, um, I'm delighted to, to see that, that finger go up. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you so much again to the panel. You're all my personal heroes. Uh, and thank you all to the audience for joining us again on such a slow news day. I would welcome your feedback, which you can submit using the form on the portal. Um, you might also like to join us in, in a few weeks for our Funding Net Zero webinar, which is scheduled for 3 December. Um, and so we are out of time. Thank you once again for joining and good night. <laughs>